Okay, cool. So today we're here to hear all about what Tess has been up to for the past five years. Four years? How long has it been? Uh, I've been here for five. Okay, five years. Before Tess was here, Tess got her bachelor's at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, um, and a master's at UC Davis. She then took a little bit of time to race snowboards before coming to grad school at Colorado School of Mines. Um, since being here, Tess has had a paper published in Environmental Science and Technology, has two more in review, and has the makings for a couple more. Um, during that time, she's got numerous presentation and paper awards from industry and universities, the CSM, awards CH2M Hill, Geosyntech, Geo one of those consulting firms, uh, Remtech Conference, um, and she also taught two classes while she was here. She taught the hydrology seminar for um, hydrologist, where she tried to further one of the missions of the lab, which is to convert hydrologists into appreciating microbiology and hydrologic systems. And she's currently teaching the undergrad fundamentals of environmental engineering class. Um, we'll hear all about Tessa's research in a few minutes, but clearly everybody in this room knows that Tessa is a great person, has an effervescent um, and wonderful, cheerful personality. She instills groupies based upon the people. Dressed up in the back of the room as Tess. Um, and if you ever want anybody to break bad news to you, Tess is <laughs> right? So for instance, should your lab be flooded over the 4th of July, <laughs> Tess is the person you want to send that email and say, it's no big deal, there are 100 people running around the building and we're not allowed in and there's some flooding, but it, it, I think we're OK. Um, so with that, we'll hear from Tess now. Not on flooding, but on research. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Josh. Um, uh, that was a great introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be able to present my research to you. Uh, I am definitely very excited about it, and I hope that by the end of this, you guys will at least be maybe a little bit less disinterested about microbiology than you might have been, um, if not really amped about the research that I'm doing here. So I'm going to share a story with you today, a science-minded story, about the interactions between perfluoroalkyl acids, PFAAs, and microorganisms. And then I'm going to discuss the implications of this research in considering both microbiology and perfluoroalkyl acids together. So as an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to be starting with motivation. And I will say throughout this presentation, these graphics that appear on this overview slide are going to follow through the presentation. They'll be in the upper left. So if you get lost at any point in the presentation, just look to the upper left, and hopefully that graphic will pull you back into the section that we're talking about. So I'm going to begin with motivation, a little bit of background on perfluoroalkyl acids and some of the issues we run into in terms of co-contaminants. Then I'm going to discuss some results I have on microbial processes, in particular some results on dechlorinating systems as well as hydrocarbon degradation. Next I'm going to be considering the effect of these microorganisms on the transport of perfluoroalkyl acids both in batch systems for absorption estimation, and then I'll briefly mention some future work that could be done to address upscaling of these phenomena. And finally, I'll tie it all back together. We can discuss the implications of this research and the implications of including microbiology and perfluoroalkyl acids together. Let's begin with the motivation. Perfluoroalkyl acids, or PFAAs, are emerging contaminants. They're contaminants of emerging concern. They are used in many industrial applications and consumer applications. How many of you guys cooked breakfast this morning? I guess maybe you didn't because you thought breakfast was coming. Oh, you guys back there. Great. Did you fry up some eggs on a Teflon-coated pan? Ooh, whoa. <laughs> well, you could be exposed to perfluoroalkyl acids. Um, if you brought a waterproof jacket today in case it rains, 
That waterproofing is actually made with perfluoroalkyl acids. So non-stick coatings, um, paper packaging, uh, pesticides, as well as aqueous foam forming foams that I'll discuss about in a little bit more detail, those are all uses where perfluoroalkyl acids are involved. These compounds are hydro and oleophobic. They also tend to form micelles. It's these unique properties that make them so useful for so many different consumer applications. They're also environmentally recalcitrant. These compounds are long carbon chains that are fully fluorinated with a carboxylate or a sulfonate head group. Um, it's very difficult to break apart that fluorine carbon bond. So in a lot of our systems, a lot of the systems I'm discussing today, we don't expect any degradation of the perfluoroalkyl acids. They pretty much stay in the form that they're in. So why should you guys care about these, other than the fact that they're used in a lot and they don't break down environmentally? Um, they are detected in many facets of our environment. They are detected in rivers, lakes, surface water, Groundwater, sediments, wastewater treatment plants, sludge, they've been detected in humans and wildlife. They do tend to bioaccumulate, so if you're ingesting something that was exposed to perfluoroalkyl acids, you might have that added into your system. They've been detected in human livers, in human blood, they've even been detected in polar bears, so these are definitely far-reaching compounds. The EPA has set provisional drinking water health advisories and soil screening guidelines for two of these compounds, perfluoroctane sulfonate and perfluoroctanoate. And those are PFAS and PFOA. Those are kind of the two big ones on the radar. Um, however, there are many more that fall within these classes. And the provisional advisories are just that. They're provisional. So these aren't actually regulated yet, but they are on EPA's radar. In a lot of cases, these compounds are co-located with other contaminants, such as TCE, trichloroethene, or hydrocarbons, such as BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethylene, or xylene. Basically, we don't know the consequences. They are used so much throughout the environment, we don't have much research on what the impacts are, both toxicologically and to sub the subsurface, microorganisms in the subsurface and their transport properties. These are the particular compounds that I studied, uh, just so you guys can understand what I've been looking at. I have 11 total analytes uh, made up of the carboxylic acids and the sulfonates. These are all of varying carbon chain length, varying from 4 to 11 for the carboxylates, and then 4 to 8 for the sulfonates. PFAS and PFOA, those are the two I mentioned that have the EPA guidelines. Um, those, are, those are previously sort of the most common found in the environment. However, now we are improving our ability for detection. We can detect a lot more of these, and we see that there are a lot more of them out there. I will also say that a lot of the uses um, in the aqueous foam boring foams, or AFFF, those are made with many of the precursors to these. So over time, what chemicals are in that aqueous foam forming foam are eventually going to break down into these final compounds. Let's discuss an example of how these PFAAs might be introduced into the environment. This is not a paper bag. This is the subsurface, uh, or the ground surface, I guess. Um, so if you imagine, say, a military training site where they might be practicing putting out fuel fires, the first step would be to add fuel to this system. That could be in the form of TCE or BTEX or a mixture, or those things could already be in the ground surface. Those will penetrate into the ground surface. A fire is set, and then through the fire training activities, aqueous film forming foam is applied. These compounds are in aqueous film forming foam. I mentioned they are hydrophobic and oleophobic, meaning they don't want to be in contact with the oil that was used to set the fire. They also don't want to be in contact with the aqueous portion of the film forming foam or the water that was in there. So they effectively smother the fire. So no air is getting into it. They put out the fire. Everyone's happy. Then 
some of that might actually get into the subsurface. And this has actually been happening on military bases around the world. There's actually a recent issue in Australia where they just now started detecting these compounds in residential drinking water wells. So it's, it's definitely something that's happening at military compounds um, and potentially elsewhere. So now we have the subsurface. It's contaminated with both perfluoroalkyl acids and TCE or BTEX. TCE and BTEX, they can be biodegraded. So essentially, this is well documented either through monitored natural attenuation, biostimulation, or bioaugmentation, where these compounds are going to break down either naturally over time, monitored natural attenuation, uh, by biostimulation, so adding a carbon source or an electron donor like molasses or lactate can stimulate the communities to break these down, or bioaugmentation. If you know the type of contaminant you have, you can actually add a particular community of microorganisms or type of microorganism that can help break down these communities. So now that we have this subsurface problem with a mixed contaminant and biodegradation of co-contaminants, that brings me to my research questions. I fundamentally wanted to know if biodegradation of these co-contaminants continues in the subsurface. So is the biodegradation of chlorinated solvents or BTEX compounds affected by PFAAs? Similarly, I wanted to know if any microbial processes other than biodegradation are impacted by PFAAs along with microbial ecology. And lastly, does the presence of biomass change perfluoroalkyl acid transport? To answer these questions, I began with evaluating the effects of PFAAs on microbial processes in chlorinating, dechlorinating systems. Reductive dechlorination is a process by which a microbial community is able to break down TCE or PCE into non-toxic ethane. So in this case, we're starting with trichloroethane. It breaks down into cis dichloroethane via this biological reaction. And that can be performed by a variety of genera. We've got Geobacter, Dehalobacter, and Dehalococoides, among others that are all able to break down TCE into cis DCE. This can be further broken down into vinyl chloride, which is the most toxic of these compounds, but there are less microorganisms that can do this. So here we have dehalococoides is a genus that can do it. Um, different strains, for example, dehalococoides macardii BAV1, as well as 195, can break this down into BC. <coughs> and finally, you have to get past the most toxic to get to the non-toxic, and that's ethene. And this, dehalococoides is the only known genus that can do this reaction. Um, for example, strain 195 can do this. BAB1 cannot. So if you imagine that we have this dehalococoides containing mixed culture, I actually used one in lab. Um, it is methanogenic. In terms of formulating our experiment, um, we developed this. This culture has been developed elsewhere um, from a TCE contaminated subsurface. If we add perfluoroalkyl acids, the question is, how are chlorinated solvents reduced? Is that being affected? So to answer this, I performed liquid batch experiments. So then these batches contain that methanogenic mixed community that contains dehalococoides, and it's one of the dehalococoides strains that can take it all the way to ethane. I looked at a varying concentration of perfluoroalkyl acids from 110 milligrams per liter total down to no PFAAs. That table I showed with my 11 analytes, if you recall, there are 11. So at 110 milligrams per liter, that means I was using 10 milligrams per liter of each. So throughout this presentation, I'll refer to the total combination, but it's actually 10 milligrams per liter, or whatever the total combination is, divided by 11. I also did a parallel experiment that I'm going to mention briefly that only contained sulfonates. So only those last three on that table. And those were at the same concentration, 110, 66, and 22. So for example, the 66 milligrams per liter case 
had 33 milligrams per liter of each sulfonate. TCE, cis-TCE, vinyl chloride, and ethene were measured over time for these microcosms. And then I also did 16S rRNA gene sequencing. So first we're going to discuss the results of the dechlorination. I'm going to show a few of these graphs, so we'll take a little bit of time walking through this first one. We have TCE, or whatever chlorinated solvent we're considering, on the y-axis. And then we have time on the x-axis. All of the cases with 110 milligrams per liter are shown in red squares. So you can see at the top, those red squares are not changing very much. So the concentration of TCE is not decreasing. There's some sort of inhibition happening. The orange circles are at 66 milligrams per liter. Um, you can sort of see here that there might be a lag, but it's not necessarily statistically significant. The green triangles are 22 milligrams per liter, and again, not statistically significantly different from the case without perfluoroalkyl acids, which are the blue X's. The gray diamond <coughs> is the case with the 110 milligrams per liter sulfonates, and I was just including that up here so you can see that there actually is no inhibition with the sulfonates only. I'm going to remove the sulfonates from the rest of the plots, but that trend follows through. There's no inhibition and dechlorination when you're thinking about just the sulfonates. But you do see that TCE inhibition at 110 milligrams per liter of the complete mixture of the 11 analytes. Uh, the, I will say that the sulfonate data is, has been submitted in a paper by some collaborators at Berkeley. I'm an author on that paper. Um, the rest of this is found in a publication that has also been submitted to Environmental Science and Technology. We are waiting with bated breath on their thoughts. So if you remember, the next breakdown product of the dechlorination reaction is cis-DCE. So if we consider cis-DCE, we can see trends that would be logical. We see a very small increase in the case with 110 milligrams per liter corresponding to that slight decrease at, of TCE. Again, we see maybe a slight lag at 66 milligrams per liter, and then 22 and no perfluoroalkyl acids behave very similarly. If we look at VC, the next product in this reaction, we're actually not getting really any VC production with 110 milligrams per liter. We are getting a delay and a slightly slower rate of production of VC in the case with 66 milligrams per liter, and then again, 22 and no perfluoroalkyl acids behave similarly. In terms of the ethene dechlorination, which is our final end product that we really want for these systems, we don't see any ethene generation in the case with 110 milligrams per liter and with 66 milligrams per liter. So that's being solved at vinyl chloride, at least for the case with 66 milligrams per liter, which as you remember is the most toxic of these. We can see that ethene is kind of kicking up at the end for no PFAAs and 22 milligrams per liter. And from this, we can conclude that the inhibition of TCE is occurring at 110 milligrams per liter with mild effects, mostly a lag and a slower rate, at 66 milligrams per liter total per alkyl acids. I did mention it previously, but 110 milligrams per liter, 10 milligrams per liter of each analyte would be representative of a alkyl acid source zone or a hot spot. Um, and that's according to literature that we currently have. That number could potentially increase, so this might not be a worst case scenario, which is sort of what I had originally planned. Um, the increases in detection and our understanding of these compounds might mean that there is actually more in the subsurface than what I've discussed here. So the question is, why are we seeing this inhibition in TCE dechlorination? We know that dehalocoides is the only organism that can take this reaction to ethene, so maybe there's something happening with dehalocoides, or maybe there's something happening within the microbial community that is affecting this reaction. To dive into what is occurring within this community, 
We have dehelicocoides. It's taking, in this case, I'm showing PCE. It's taking it all the way to ethane. A hydrogen is used in this process to kick off that chlorine. And then dehelicocoides is also consuming acetate or lactate as an electron donor. Dehelicocoides is a very finicky organism. Of course, it's so useful, but it's very picky. Uh, it requires methionine and chlorine synthesis from the community. It's not able to make those themselves. All you need to know about what those are, they're necessary for dehelicocoides to break down ethane. So if they're break down to ethane, if they're not getting those compounds, then it's not going to be able to complete this reaction. Dehelicocoides is also a, an anaerobe, a strict, strict anaerobe. So if there's any oxygen in the system, dehelicocoides is not going to thrive. This community also contains oxygen scavengers that can use that oxygen before it starts affecting dehelicocoides. Similarly, this is a methanogenic culture, so it can produce methane. Methane is a competitor for the acetate or lactate and for the hydrogen. So it's going to be a trade-off. If you're seeing a lot of methane generation, you might not be seeing complete ethane, ethane being produced. To see whether any of these things, particularly the community contributions, if those are affected within our community, that might be what's killing off or stopping dehelicocoides. Or dehelicocoides might be the only one that's affected by perfluoroalkyl acids. I was able to look through my sequencing in order to understand those interactions. This is a beta diversity plot of my sequenced samples. So beta diversity is just the comparison between samples. So on the x-axis, this explains 60% of the variance. The y-axis explains 14%. All you need to know for these graphs is that if some things are close together, that means they're similar. So obviously, we see that the 110 milligram per liter cases are very similar. They're clustered together, but yet they're not anywhere near the 6622 or no perfluoroalkyl acids, meaning that there's something very different happening when these communities are exposed to 110 milligrams per liter. These, this can be proven statistically. It's not just, I made the circle look like these are over here. Um, that can be proven with statistics. Um, they are significantly different. Um, but the question is, why are they different? What is in that community that's so different from the others? So we can look at Zach's favorite bar chart, and we can see this column represents no perfluoroalkyl acids. This column represents the case with 110 milligrams per liter. And I just want you to focus. You don't have to read all those, read all those words, but I just want you to focus on a couple things, namely <coughs> dehelicocoides, which is shown in that orange bar on the very top. There's obviously a lot less in the case without or the case with perfluoroalkyl acids, and a lot more without. That's really big. <laughs> Similarly, we can see this methanobacteriaceae or a methanobacterium. This is actually an archaea that is generating methane. So I mentioned that interplay between methane generation and dechlorination. That can be easily observed in the system. Either dehelicocoides is dying off, so methane is taking advantage, or dehelicocoides is, or methane is doing great. It really likes those perfluoroalkyl acids, and that's sort of squashing dehelicocoides' ability to dechlorinate. I'm not sure which it is. Um, there's definitely a lot of potential for future research to really understand that. So those are very obvious, and those are very important things that jump out from here. But what else could be impacted? We still haven't really answered the question whether there's something else in the community that's affecting the vitality of dehelicocoides. So I'm just going to dive into it. This is a phylogenetic tree. And what you need to know for this is that the distance along the x direction is how far something is from a common ancestor. So 
I actually, based on the filtering that I did, I only ended up with 17 operational taxonomic units within my culture, and they largely fit with what has been described for these communities. So what I've done here, if you can see the arrows to the right of of my sequences here. Um, I will also say I'm showing the names there are the lowest assigned taxonomy, and that's what I use to assign putative functionality. The arrows mean whether or not they were enhanced in the presence of perfluoroalkyl acids or if they were repressed. So for example, an up arrow means that when I added perfluoroalkyl acids, they were enhanced. They did better in the presence of perfluoroalkyl acids. And these ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, actually did better in the presence of perfluoroalkyl acids. The size of the arrow, arrow uh, denotes how much better they did. So that methanobacterium, it did a lot better, so it has a big arrow. Whereas that porphyromonadaceae, it did a little bit better, but it wasn't a huge difference. If it has an arrow, it means it was a statistically significant difference but not necessarily a huge difference, at least for that corporal monodaceae. We can see these ones that have the arrow pointing down, and again, dehylcocoides right up here in the pink box, that has a large downward arrow, meaning that it was repressed to a large degree. You can see that all members of delta proteobacteria, shown in this yellow box, were not actually affected in one way or the other by perfluoroalkyl acids. In terms of what these members of the community do, I establish putative functions. So some of these are capable of methionine synthesis. For example, all of Clostridia and Delta Proteobacteria, as well as Treponema. They're also fermenters, so the organisms that are able to break down that lactate and acetate Again, Clostridia, Treponema, and Bacteroidea. Coronoid synthesis, we can see that in a variety of organisms, as well as oxygen scavenging. So, I, I just did a large data dump for you guys, but what comes out of this is that there are very diverse effects on the community that might be impacting dehylocoides. It's not a very satisfying conclusion, but essentially, I've been unable to find a trend with either phylogeny, it's not trending based on where it falls in the tree, or function. Some things that perform a specific function might be enhanced or repressed. So essentially, when you're exposing these systems to perfluoroalkyl acids, you're going to have very diverse effects on the communities. So now we want to know, we can ask, if dechlorination is affected if we're looking at dehylcocoides in pure culture. I mentioned that dehylcocoides is very finicky, so it's difficult to grow these in pure culture. The reaction is a lot slower, uh, but we're able to add all the nutrients it needs so that it can continue this reaction all by itself. This should be able to tell us whether dehylcocoides is being directly impacted or if it is something else in the community that is impacting dehylcocoides. So again, thinking about the TCE dechlorination profile, we see the same thing. We see inhibition at 110 milligrams per liter, a definite lag this time at 66 milligrams per liter, and then pretty similar for the 22 and no PFAA cases. Here I included an abiotic control, so you can see the abiotic control, so without dehalocoides, behaves very similarly to the case with 110 milligrams per liter. Following this through to cis DCE, we see the same thing. We see very mild cis DCE production at 110 milligrams per liter, delayed onset <coughs> at 66 milligrams per liter, and then not statistically different between 22 and the abiotic case. Continuing on to VC, same trends, more apparent. We don't have any VC production at 110 milligrams per liter, a delay at 66 and then potentially a delay at 22, um, although the rates are not statistically different. 
And then ethene, unfortunately we didn't see any ethene generation in this case, which is what we would expect considering the kinetic favorability of dehalocoides in pure culture, as well as the fact that we still have significant TCE in our system. Um, previously, ethene generation kicked in when TCE got below six, six micromoles. So as you can see, we're right on that threshold, and if the experiment were to go longer, maybe we would see ethene generation, but for this case, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's pretty clear that inhibition is occurring at 110 milligrams per liter with dehalocoides in pure culture, and again, mild effects at 66 milligrams per liter. Now we can come back to my research questions. Is the biodegradation of chlorinated solvents effective? Yes, we see that it is significantly inhibited <coughs> at source zone concentrations of perfluorohalkyl acids. Are microbial processes or the ecology of the system effective? Yes, dehalocoides is being directly repressed by these perfluorohalkyl acids. Similarly, some members of the community are repressed, while others are enhanced. And as I mentioned, this data has been submitted to Environmental Science and Technology in two different papers. So when those are published, you should definitely read them. All right, so now we can move on to hydrocarbon degradation. To evaluate the ability for continued hydrocarbon degradation in my systems, I use a pure culture of Rhodococcus Josii RHA1. I will call it RHA1 for short. This organism is a very common lab rat, like E. coli lab microorganism rat. Um, it's commonly found in soil, and it's a known BTEX degrader or other organic compound degrader. So it's a very useful organism. It's found very commonly in the subsurface. I wanted to know if we add perfluoroalkyl acids to the system, how do perfluoroalkyl acids affect the bioremediation of, of BTEX by rhodococcus. To do this, I again had microcosms that contained RHA1 and toluene as a representative BTEX compound, <laughs> along with 110 milligrams per liter perfluoroalkyl acids. I didn't do a concentration range in this case. I went with the worst case scenario and figured I could move on from there if I needed to. I measured toluene concentration over time using GCFID and I compared to that with an abiotic control, and then I also compared it to toluene degradation without perfluoroalkyl acids. Here are the results. This is very different than the dechlorination results. The purple line up top, that's our abiotic control. Again, the red squares represent 110 milligrams per liter, and the blue X's is a case without perfluoroalkyl acids. You can see there's really no difference in hydrocarbon degradation in the presence of 110 milligrams per liter. So that was pretty straightforward. You're going to get continued toluene degradation in the subsurface, potentially. I also wanted to know if there are any effects on RHA1 specifically. To do this, I drew RHA1 in nutrient-rich media with 110 milligrams per liter and one, one case without perfluoroalkyl acids. I measured growth over time uh, in terms of protein and optical density. I measured extracellular polymeric substances, or EPS. I also measured stress-related gene expression using RTQPCR, so I can select a specific gene because RT1 is a great lab rat. It has a fully annotated genome. And then I also compared that to growth, stress, EPS production without perfluoroalkyl acids. Here's what happened. This is the bottom of the bottle I showed that I grew these organisms in. So without perfluoroalkyl acids is on the top, at 110 milligrams per liter is on the bottom. I don't know how easy it is for you guys to see, but there are things floating in here. This looks like floaty boogers, <laughs> which is really essentially what they are. If you zoom in using light microscopy, you can see that without perfluoroalkyl acids, the RHA1 is evenly distributed in solution. However, this is sort of the edge of one of these boogers, or a flock. And you can see that 
they are very densely packed inside that flock, and then there's not much outside in the solution. If we look at scanning electron microscopy images, we again see something very interesting. The case without perfluoroalkyl acids looks like it's clumped together, but that's actually just a byproduct of the dehydration we have to do in order to visualize it. But what you can see is uniform length cells, uniform shape, uniform size, whereas here with perfluoroalkyl acids, they're a little bit longer. They have like funny knobs on them. Um, and there's also this gray substance here. That gray substance is very typical of dehydrated EPS, or that extracellular polymeric substances. That EPS is the glue that's holding these boogers together. <laughs> so what we see when we're growing RH1 in nutrient-rich conditions is that there is an enhanced EPS production. There is also an increase in stress-related genes. I am not going to show that data because we talked about it for a long time. Um, but I, I tested out multiple stress-related genes, and there is a statistically significant increase. So we can conclude here that perfluoroalkyl acids are actually doing something at a cellular level to these organisms. We can come back to the research questions and add to them now. Is the biodegradation of chlorinated solvents or VTEX compounds affected? Toluene degradation is not affected because this is a representative compound. There are assumptions going into assuming that the other VTEX compounds wouldn't be affected, but that's a pretty was a pretty clear result. Are the microbial processes or ecology being affected? And we can say yes. There is definitely a cellular response, both manifested as EPS production and as stress. These results have been published um, in Environmental Science and Technology earlier this spring. I will happily share a copy of it with you if you want to read it. So now that we know that the presence of perfluoroalkyl acids is causing this flocculation. This flocculation is actually very typical of, say, a biofilm formation. That EPS production is what sticks the microbes to a surface. So the question is, if you have a subsurface, like you might at a military training site, is this biofilm formation going to change the transport of perfluoroalkyl acids? Is it going to clog the pore spaces? Is it going to provide extra absorption sites for perfluoroalkyl acids? It's a great question. That is our third research <laughs> question. Do the presence of, does the presence of biomass change perfluoroalkyl acid transport? To answer this, we can discuss absorption estimation from batch systems. So what I did here, I used, again, RHA1 that was grown without perfluoroalkyl acids very high concentration of it. It looks like really, it's actually really gross, really dense, um, solid, almost solid, gelatinous cellular mixture. These were inactivated with sodium azide. So they're not going to be growing. They're not going to be degrading anything. They're just going to be cells that are present. I added 50 micrograms per liter each. Sorry, that was not a total sum, but 50 micrograms per liter of each perfluoroalkyl acid. I measured the concentration of PFAAs in the aqueous solution, as well as I extracted them from the cell. So I have a solid associated PFAA concentration. I can calculate the distribution coefficient, which is known as KD. And that's just the ratio of what is in the solid phase versus what's in the aqueous phase. I can also normalize to the organic carbon fraction of the cellular system in order to compare it to literature. That's a very common technique. Normalizing to organic carbon helps you know, depending on what your soil is, you can look at different soils and see what the transport properties might be of your compound. The y-axis, in this case, is the log KOC. KOC is my organic carbon normalized absorption coefficient. So I've accounted for the organic carbon in my cells. The x-axis represents the analyte. So for example, PFBA has a log KOC value of, I don't know, 2.1. Um, and then it all for soil, the value is actually lower. 
So what you can see in the system, the soils in the blue triangles that was actually published previously by Jen Guelfo out of Colorado School of Mines, uh, we found that we're getting more absorption to cellular organic carbon than we are to soil organic carbon. One interesting thing about these compounds, typically organic compounds have absorption coefficients that are a function of carbon chain length. In this case, it should be just linear. It should be, there should be less sorption when you get down to these shorter compounds. However, in this case, as was observed by Jen, and it's hard to tell here, but I do observe the same thing, there's actually, you begin to get an increased absorption for the shorter chain lengths. So it's very interesting phenomenon for these com compounds, but we also see that when we're considering absorption to cells. You might be asking, what, what do we care if it's sticking a lot to cells only? That In what system are we only going to have pure cells? Probably not. So I designed another experiment where I combined cells and soil. Again, this is with a this is with a low organic carbon sediment. So um, the organic carbon content I will discuss later, but it's typical of maybe more of an aquifer sediment, something deeper, not necessarily a soil on the surface. I added varying concentrations of biomass. I'm calling them bio low, bio mead, and bio high. The bio low and bio medium are typical of what you might find. Bio high is a little bit on the extreme side, but you could easily find organic carbon or cellular contents within these ranges. So again, I measured the aqueous concentration of perfluoroalkyl acids, the solids associated, calculated KD, and normalized organic carbon. That normalization to organic carbon, I actually performed a couple of different ways. So detailed walkthrough, this is my system. I have some perfluoroalkyl acids sticking to my solid phase, some in the aqueous phase. The concentrations I'm, I'm plugging into KD have actually been measured. The KOC value is just KD divided by the fraction of organic carbon. And this is this can be calculated in a couple different ways. Typically, fraction of organic carbon of soil is calculated this way, where you just take your mass of soil, you make that the denominator, and then you know the organic carbon content of your soil because you've shipped it off for testing. This is usually a well-known lab soil, so these, these experiments are performed in a the lab. Um, they're not with this value, you're not necessarily accounting for biomass. You may have biomass growth in your system. You may not. Who knows how long it's been sitting in your lab. With this one, this FOC mix, that accounts for the organic carbon derived from cellular mass. So it's got that MOC cell there. So that's what's derived from mass. Um, the FOC for the soil is 0 0.0017. So this was a very low organic carbon sediment that I mentioned. And then this MOC cell and M total, those are actually measured from protein, comp protein content or measured by mass. So here are, here's the first set of results. This is using that traditional FOC value. So the FOC that was calculated by a lab when I sent my soil sample off to be analyzed. And you can see sort of the similar trends. The, Red square is the bio high. So that was actually very similar to my cellular only value that I observed previously. The rest kind of overlap. So you can see the orange circles, that is the bio medium. And then the blue triangles is the case with cells or with soil only, sorry. So as you can see, in the longer chain length acids, there is actually more absorption. I've seen more absorption in the case with mid-level biomass. It's pretty comparable in the case with the low level of biomass. And then same thing for the sulfonates. There's a lot more absorption for the bio-high case, a little bit more for the longer chains, um, particularly PFOS, for the bio-mid case. So we can conclude here that for longer change, chains, the traditional FOC values will give us a larger KOC. So we're seeing, we might be seeing more retardation 
at the longer chain lengths if we have a system with a lot of biomass. If we consider the other way to calculate FOC, it sort of shifts everything. So here, we're actually getting a lower value for sorption in the case of bio high, lower for bio low and bio mid, particularly at the shorter length chains. What this is telling us is that if we were to use that normal organic carbon value derived from a laboratory soil, if we have a lot of biomass, we not, might not be accurately predicting perfluorohalkyl acid transport. This is also telling us that it depends on chain length. You might have a pretty good predictor based on those laboratory values if you're looking for those mid-range compounds. So absorption is dependent on organic fraction and perfluoroalkyl acid chain length. And then again, depending on your choice for your organic carbon normalization, you might be picking something that might not accurately describe transport in the subsurface. Coming back to that research question, does the presence of biomass change perfluoroalkyl acid transport? And we see that yes, there is increased absorption to cellular organic carbon, although in mixed systems, the degree of absorption increase, or I will say decrease, is a function of chain length. And that traditional laboratory estimates of absorption may be, or may be inappropriate for low organic carbon sediments. And this work is all a paper being prepared right now. You might be asking, what is actually happening in the subsurface? If you're a good hydrologist, you're wondering, how do I upscale the system? And one way to do that uh, is to assess some flow through columns. So essentially, with a flow through system, I would be able to understand changes in porosity and permeability, perhaps as a result of biofilm formation. So if I'm getting a lot of biofilm formation that's clogging the pores, maybe I'm changing the advective transport. Similarly, will the retardation of perfluoroalkyl acids increase due to cellular presence? Testing that hypothesis of what we observed in batch systems, are they absorbing to that cellular mass more so than soil? And then I'd also be able to see if there are any shifts in community ecology after a long-term exposure. So finally, we can discuss the implications of this work and what all of this research they did upstairs in this building has to do with the real world. Quick review, we saw inhibition of dechlorination of TCE in a mixed community, which might mean that you would be getting less bioremediation near a source zone. You're going to have less dechlorination if you're planning on remediating for TCE and you don't know if you have a perfluoroalkyl acid source zone. I don't know what your budget is, but maybe it's not a bad idea to check. Similarly, we saw diverse effects in the microbial community, and I will say this is not a very satisfying implication, but that the impacts on the ecology might be unpredictable. So I'm still hoping that some research will shed some light on what is actually being impacted. Uh, for example, if it's only gram-negative or gram-positive that's being impacted. Um, I found no trends with that, but research could be ongoing. We also found that there's inhibition of dehalococoides in pure culture, meaning that dehalococoides is directly impacted. So again, you're going to have less dechlorination near source zones. You might have an increase in cis-DCE or BC production if the other organisms that are capable of dechlorinating are not affected. We see no impact on toluene degradation, which that's good, that's a good thing. So bioremediation where perfluoroalkyl acids are present should continue as you would expect. We see enhanced EPS production and a stress response, meaning that there might be some sort of biological biofilm formation that could change perfluoroalkyl acid transport. It also might mean that there are toxicological effects for those other organisms. We also see increased sorption of cells versus soil organic carbon, implying that retardation of perfluoroalkyl acids in subsurface systems may be greater than previously predicted based on systems in a lab that were conducted without 
any microorganisms. So with that, I hope you guys sort of understand some of what's going on in our environment in terms of emerging contaminants and microbiology. I'd like to thank my committee. Uh, all of them are in this room, which is the hardest part. Um, also, I must thank the Friends of Forest that have helped me do my PFAA analysis, my LCMSMS work. It's not my favorite thing, but they helped me through it. Also, the Gem Lab, past, present, and potentially future um, undergrads that have helped me, colleagues, those that have gone before. And then uh, my collaborators at Berkeley, um, Katie Harding Marjanovic and Lisa Alvarez Kahn. And then all of my colleagues and friends that helped me practice have been supporting me throughout this process. Uh, thank you very much to you guys. And to all of you people and animals here. <laughs> thank you very much. So with that, uh, we'll field questions from everyone but the committee. I guess I forgot to mention at the beginning, the test just covered committee members, John, Dave, Chris, and John. Um, so questions, and I'll let the test, test field and kind of see who she wants to call on or not call on. Um, 
I would say that it's more a function of the communities or the organisms that are biodegrading these contaminants rather than the contaminants themselves. So if you have a robust organism like RHA1 that can form EPS, that can sort of form that protective mucus layer, or that just it's, it's really hard to kill RHA1. So if you have like NDMA, for example, another organic contaminant, if that is in your system and RHA1 can degrade it, I'd imagine that that would probably continue. Whereas if you have something else that requires a different organism, um, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head, but I'd say it's dependent more on the communities and the microbes that are capable of biodegradation rather than on the chemical itself. I hope that whoever said that was happy. <laughs> Delayed response, so maybe they'll respond. <laughs> okay. Read. Um, so I'm curious, uh, if you provide a mutation for upscale absorption, what happens when you take your batch uh, experiments, your batch results out to the field? Um, when there's heterogeneity, there's a lot of complicated factors and how that might affect the results. Posture the problem. Yeah. Um, I think that is great hydrology question. Um, and I, I mean, that's sort of one of the issues with doing the laboratory-derived batch absorption experiments anyways. Um, and the idea with the organic carbon normalized absorption coefficient is that it wouldn't matter if there are heterogeneities, if you have like a clay layer and you know, a bunch of sand, it shouldn't matter because you have that organic carbon normalized coefficient. And I guess if you knew how much of that in the subsurface it was interacting with, then it wouldn't matter. But of course, we don't know what exactly is in the subsurface. Um, so I would say that it's, it's, it'd be hard to predict. I mean, it, it can be applied as sort of maybe a general um, first round, maybe informing sampling for perfluoroalkyl acids later on in a field site. Um, so if you did have sort of a basic model of your system, you plug in these laboratory-derived contaminants, you can say, okay, the plume should be here at this time, so we can sample here and check. Um, but I'd say as with any subsurface system, you have to have that interaction between <coughs> field sampling, your modeling, and you have to be updating your laboratory parameters as you go along. Awesome. I have if I can ask a quick follow-up. I'm yeah. curious if you went to the Rand House speaker uh, last week for summary. Um, yeah. so he was talking about I met exactly, him though. <laughs> he was talking about exactly the system. Um, and it's been very successful in sort of the the um the bottom chloride chain and had various toxicities of course. But he uses a much simpler approach, um, so he could use sort of a microbial uh, process, which is pretty straightforward, time to end decay from one compound to the next. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how, it, you know, when you talk to Chris, or he thought about how your results might inform that kind of analysis. It's similar to my first question. Instead of, you know, how much, how much should we as hydrologic monology successors, how much should we change up what we do and say, well, you know, a, a pretty straightforward linear decay constant is not going to cut it anymore. Or should we start taking uh, microbes? Or should, what's the cool way to take a uh, I'd say, in this case, sorry, Josh, maybe the microbes are less important in terms of modeling. Um, but if you know that you have, I mean, it's, it's all about understanding your system and knowing what's in your system. And if you know that you, like, if you're on a military training site, and you're near the fire training area, then you might have to update those, those rate coefficients because we know that dechlorination is probably going to be inhibited. If it's not going to be completely inhibited, it might have a slower rate um, that could be used. So I'd say I think it depends on, on your location. If you, if you don't, if there's no reason to be concerned about perfluoroalkyl acid content, then probably wouldn't have to worry about this. But if you think that you are in a zone where you could have these high concentrations of perfluoroalkyl acids, then I think you could incorporate a simple linear adjustment. Kate? Hey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I would try and measure amount of the 
What is it about the DVO <coughs> is only strain that can fully decoordinate books? It's just magic. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's the only <coughs> one that we know of, which doesn't mean that it's the only one, um, because microbiology is very fascinating and growing very quickly. Um, thus far, it's the only one that just has a complete set of enzymes that can dechlorinate it. Um, for example, the geobacter can't go all the way to ethene. It has a similar set of enzymes, but it's missing that final one that can take it. So it's, it's really that genetic encoding, essentially. Michael Morse. Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that we're all kind of invested by this background noise of PMPAs, who are uh, exposure to everyday products. Um, I'm just curious how, uh, what the magnitude of that, uh, or how that affects your experimentation, and if you're able to isolate that or, or block that in a sense, or how did you overcome that background noise of your, of your own? <laughs> that is a great question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a good point, and that's something. I mean, Chris Higgins can also speak to that. That we do get, we do tend to get background, especially for like the shorter chain PFBA. Um, and I, I think like one of the hypotheses at one point was that when they're waxing the floors, that might have some in it. So if they wax the floors in the lab, it could potentially be contaminating. Um, there was the issue with fluorinated snowboard wax. I'm a competitive snowboard racer, and I use fluorinated wax that contains these compounds. Um, so there was a, a period in there where I was actively waxing and getting a lot of terrible background. Like I couldn't even see what I was measuring. Um, and that's, I guess, just more better practices, you know. Um, I don't, I try not to wear the same clothes that I wax in to do science in. Um, but also, I mean, we do have pretty cool technology in terms of analytical chemistry and being able to, like, we add mass labeled surrogates so we can know how much we're adding right beforehand, and that's unique. That shouldn't be in the environment unless you had some and spilled it all over your lab bench, um, which I haven't done. Um, so you can see, you know, if, if that's, if there's a lot of noise compared to that, you can almost sort of get rid of some of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting problem that's, that's not unique to these compounds, but does provide some hurdles in terms of analysis. Kind of a follow-up on Mike's question, it's a policy question. If you had the power to stop all PFAA production, do you think it's worth the, the uh, trade-off? Because they provide a lot, of, a lot of benefits, like you've said, that things we use every day, but they have unknown consequences. Do you think it would be worth stopping production of all these uh, chemicals or not? Oh, <laughs> this is like, this is my core ethical dilemma. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's good for us as a culture, us as people, to reduce our use of everything and to use alternatives when we can. Um, so you don't you don't necessarily need a brand new Gore-Tex jacket every season. Um, you know, get some. What's, what's the wax that you put on your boot? Your boot? Oh yeah, the snow seal. Snow seal. That's made out of like beeswax. Um, so, you know, use other options when you can. Um, like, it's, it's in the coating. Like, these things are in the coatings on pizza boxes, so your pizza box, your pizza doesn't stick to your pizza box. Is that really necessary? I don't know that that's really necessary. But when you're thinking about putting out a fuel <laughs> fire, like a plane crash, they're working on alternatives to these compounds which may or may not be worse for the environment. Um, but I mean, when the question is, if I don't put out this fire, I'm going to immediately die, versus if I don't put out this fire, it might kill some microbes in the subsurface in 10 years. Like, you can't really compare that. So I'd say, in terms of personal use, you know, be conscientious and try not to use as much, and maybe 
those could be regulated a little bit more, but in terms of you know emergency uses, then I think that they are actually good. Dr. Khan? Another question uh, from the staff is, how did you determine your concentrations that you used? Is 110 milligrams per liter what you would find at a source zone? Oh, well, yeah, that's a good recap. Yeah, 110 milligrams per liter, I did choose that to be representative of a source zone. Um, so a single analyte, a lot of, in a lot of places, they only have data for like PFAS and PFOA. And those might occur around 10 milligrams per liter, that order, order of magnitude. So I extrapolated to assume that every analyte would be there at that, that amount, um, which at first I was like, maybe that's crazy, maybe that's not really what might be there. But um, again, with the increasing increases in detection, um, they're being detected even more in places. Um, our instruments are getting better at detecting them, so we can detect higher concentrations, um, we're learning more about the precursor compounds. We're learning that those break down into these. So even if you measure 10 milligrams per liter now, given time, that might increase because it's being generated. Um, so yeah, it's, it's representative of a source zone or a hot spot. Um, for example, if you do have absorption to either a naphthol or um, you do have a really high organic carbon system, um, that concentration will increase. Thanks, Asaf. Okay. Any final questions? <laughs> no final questions. All right, you're all dismissed. <laughs>